While being a teacher may not earn the six-figure income you have always dreamed of, it has other benefits far beyond that of a hefty paycheck. The primary reward of being a teacher is being able to see the results of your hard work in action every single day. Do you remember when you were a kid and you had difficulty understanding a certain concept and then bam, all of a sudden you understand. As a teacher, you get to cultivate lasting relationships with students, parents, staff and peers. In most jobs, you deal with customers on a daily basis, but rarely get to know them. You'll see your students five days a week, unfortunately, (laughs) and you may have some of them for years and years and years to come. Having this type of access to students means you can really see how your teaching has benefited them while you watch them progress. My guest is no exception to that rule. His name is Sananda Edwards. That's Sananda with a T. He's an educator, mental health advocate, community servant, and I'm proud to say one of my former and favorite students. I caught up with Sananda a few weeks ago and he mentioned to me that he was writing a new book and asked me if I could do the foreword. Well, this book is finished and he is joining me in the bomb shelter with copies hot off the presses. So stay tuned for sound bombing. If you want to know how I was as a teacher or if you just want to hear Sananda's story, I encourage you to stay, stay tuned. Peace. Drop the bomb. We're gonna drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Back to Sound Bombing. This is your man, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields. And if you listen to that intro, I am so excited to be sitting down in the bomb shelter with one of my favorite students, my man, Sananda Edwards, <laughs> in the building. What's up, Sananda? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> all is well. All is well. Good brother, Shields. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Excited to be here, man. Good things. No question. <laughs> well, man, th- thanks for joining us in the bomb shelter. Now, I know people want to... They want to know how it was being in my class. We're going to get to that shortly, man. People, people all over the country want to know. This dude travels all over, and I heard that he was his teacher and this, that, the other. So you can, right. I will allow you to give them, give some of those nuggets away as we as we start to uh, talk about this book and yeah. start to talk about your life, man. Well, welcome, man. Thank Bye-bye. you. Uh, Bye-bye. Congratulations. I'm so sorry Appreciate uh, that it. I could Appreciate not it. attend uh, the book signing, but I saw uh, the post. Not I saw uh, City College in the building. I saw Absolutely. Morgan State University in the building. I saw yes. a, a lot of a lot of a lot of my former students who were looking older than me. I must say, <laughs> I'm I don't know what they've been eating people, man. I mean, look, look, look. I, I might. I feel like I ate a couple people or two, man. But you, you, you look, look. But the thing is, you took the dip out of that fountain. You just, out of that fountain. You somehow, bro. So that's a whole different level, man. Hey, man that's, that's a good living. That's good life. You all get me yeah. young. For those that don't know, I taught Sanand at the Great City College. I was a new teacher coming out of Gramlin State University, just coming out of Mexico, actually. And I ended up in Baltimore City College, one of the greatest institutions in the country, the third oldest high school in the city. If y'all don't know anything about this school, believe me, just Google City College. These jokers, that's like Harvard, Yale. City City forever. City City forever. (laughs) Pleasure. No question about it. No question about it. And it's funny because being from Baltimore, most people, you know, most people around the country, they ask you what school, what school you went to. Generally, it means what college, right? You know, what, what college did you go to? Here in Baltimore, 
different level. When they're asking you what school you went to, it's definitely what high school you went to. Yeah. So I'm proud to say City Forever, City yeah, College. I, that's how I, it is, right? I never, yeah. I never understood that. I mean, you could walk around and be like, I went to City College, and you and you 14 years old. You're like, man, you in a college? Are you a genius, man? Yeah, that's so, right, that's right. So, so now, yeah. let, let, let's tell, let, yeah. let, let's be honest, man. How much fun did you used to have in my class, man? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Um, I and and it's, and it's crazy that that that, that, that this is so crazy. I used to have an absolute ball in your class, and I think the main reason why was because you, I mean you knew how to reel us in, and you know what I mean. Like you knew how to let us have fun, but reel us in at the same time. So everybody just had an amazing time in your class. I got to be honest about it because that's, I mean it's just not the case generally in high school. First of all, you got a young. Um, African American teacher, that's not the norm in a lot of classrooms. So we come in, we thinking, okay, well, we're going to see how this thing goes. And it, I mean, it was just an amazing experience. You knew how to relate to us, you let us have a little bit of fun. But I mean, you had your expectations, you definitely held us accountable, but at the same time, you, you made learning fun. So I got to be completely honest about that. You were absolutely by far my favorite teacher. And that goes for a lot of the folks that, um, that, that graduated uh, through City with me. You were their favorite teacher. We just had such a good time. Well, that's but also, I'm going to say another thing that you did. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Sananda. Yeah. I was going to say um, another thing that you did was it, it wasn't just like, a, you know, your typical nine to five with you. Like one of the things that you did, like you made sure that you met us. Yeah, you had like coach classes and things like that. But you were involved in some and in bringing some like kind of extracurricular things to us. I remember me and uh, Stephen Wiley. Um, and I think Mike Johnson did that poem that you and your homeboys kind of put together. Man, oh my goodness, Fantasia! Like I'm telling, you, she was about five a body <laughs> that never could remember. Now, mind you, I'm out of high school twenty years already, and I remember that because you poured into us, man. Like you, you made sure that we had the very best, the most. You gave us uh, an unbelievable amount of attention. But it wasn't just in the classroom. You made sure you held us down outside the classroom. You poured into us academically, socially. We could come to you with our problems and things like that. And you gave us the real. You didn't just tell us what we wanted to hear, but you gave us the real. We really appreciate that. I absolutely appreciate well, that. Well, no you know, it's an honor to talk to you because, you know, I wrote a book called What I Learned in the Midst of Chaos, The Making of an Ubuntu Teacher. Yeah. And we talk about yeah. whatever happened to that student that got away. And I'm sure for those listeners that are listening to this, this show, uh, be it a teacher or not a teacher, Sananda, we always want to know whatever happened to those students uh, that right. have come across the good or the bad and the ugly. I'm sure y'all thought, was like, man, this cat from Chicago, that's all I talked about was a shot. Right. I, y'all like this dude young. We gonna run. I know y'all, we gonna run his ass. Uh, I know y'all thought all this Absolutely. Stuff. That's what we talk. That's what we talk. Little girl, all right, the little girl's trying to be flirtatious, flirtatious. I'm like, yeah, oh. I, I said, I'm checking out the substitutes. I ain't checking out no little girl uh, 15, exactly. 16. And y'all are so man. crazy. Y'all start introducing yeah. me to substitute teachers in the building. Then eventually. Yeah. And I said, these cats are in. They're going to get me fired up in there. So come on, man. Come on, man. So I was, I'm honored to sit down with you. But what's interesting, you know, when Sananda had approached me, and I did write the foreword to the book for, for those yeah. who want to get the second edition, you'll see yeah. that. You'll see that in there. And I was honored to do that. But what was interesting, mm -hmm. you know, when I did see you and you told me that you're going to be writing this book, I was really, really excited about that. Um, because we did have some serious conversations in the classroom. But what sort yes, of blew sir. me away um, when when I got a copy of the book and I read the book, Sananda has stayed on top of me. And I thank you for your patience. You know, your teacher has oh. a very, very busy, busy schedule. And Absolutely. so, you know, it was just yep. an honor to do it. And I was flying back from California, had, had a long flight. And um, I said, let me go ahead and read this brother's book. And it's it's not a it's not a thick book. It's it's it's, it's pretty mm -hmm. you know straightforward to the point. And the book is called The Extraordinary uh, Mister Nobody. And we're going to talk mm -hmm. about the type of that title. But what blew yeah. me away, um, you know, is that the opening of the book when you said, "I remember this cat would always come to class with a smile. It was almost like he never had a bad day." And that's a quote mm -hmm. for me. And what I will say, mm -hmm. Sananda, was that you and that was, I remember you sitting on the back row. You never, you, you, you never came in like something was going on with you. I mean, you were fired up every day. I mean, it might have been one or two days. And mm -hmm. it blew me away is when I read that book. And for those teachers that are trying to figure out what's going on with your students, then as I opened up the book and you said, Mr. Shields, as I'm reading this book, he was like, my days weren't as great. And you mm -hmm. still put on this, this mask when you came into this class. So how does the, yeah. before we dive into the book, for those teachers that are listening and who are working with these kids, 
you know, and, and we find this out later of, of things that were taking place in your life. I ran into one of your one of another one of your former uh, students, uh, Carla Vandeval. I think it's Vandeval's uh, yeah. name. And we, yeah, had long, we had a long talk as well. And she said, you, you, you don't know what was going on in my life at that time. And, we, you know, I was hard on you guys because I knew the streets would be harder. But then she shared some very intimate things. And I just didn't know what was going on. So to hear to open up the book. And then they see that this kid that was so bubbly that I did not know that these demons were just destroying you on the inside. Let, let, let's talk about that, Sananda. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, the, the, like, the first thing I want to um, thank you for taking the time, first of all, to read the book. Um, I really thought it was kind of like a shot in the wind me asking you to do the full work because I know how busy your schedule, your schedule is. Um, I know how many lives that you're impacting. I appreciate that. I definitely look at you as one of my biggest mentors and biggest role models. So I was so appreci- appreciative of that. And then when I sent it, I honestly didn't think you were going to have the time to do it. So, first of all, first and foremost, again, thank you for that. Um, but I will say this, um, it was definitely, high school has, high school is just, it's just so much that, that's going on in high school. You have, you know, your, your, your relationship with your parents that you have going on, you have your relationships with your siblings that you have going on, you have your relationships with your classmates, and then you start forming relationships with your teachers and things like that. So again, it's one of those kind of testaments to you and what you brought to city, what you brought to our classrooms, what you brought to our lives. You were the type of teacher who you noticed our patterns. You knew that, you know, Sananda, he's generally the bubbly guy. So what's going on? So there were times when you would hold me after class and ask me, hey, Sananda, right now, what's going on? And there were times when, honestly, I wouldn't be honest. Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Shields. I'm good. I'm good. No worries. You know what I'm saying? I just didn't eat breakfast or, you know, something simple. And the, but the thing is, you asking that question was big. It was big to me. It means that you were taking extra special care. It means that you were noticing the things that were going on with me. You were noticing the patterns. So that was a big, big deal. And that's why I, I fully agree with what Carla said. We all have so many things that were going on and we kind of needed support systems through that. And you were one of those big, big support systems. Simply by being there, you, you were a constant. I don't remember you missing days from school. Now, you may have. <laughs> I don't remember you missing days from school. You were there every day. You were one of the constants for us. And when you have that, someone who is there every day consistently, someone who is going to, again, going to hold you accountable because you did that. You were hard on us. But at the same time, you allowed us some leeway to kind of be expressive, be creative, all those wonderful things. It was a very, very big deal to us. And the reality is, we look forward to that. Regardless of, regardless of what was going on in our homes, we look forward to coming to school. And you were a really, really big part of that. No question. And so how, how were you able to come to school, dealing with what you were dealing with, and you were so bubbly? How, how do we help a kid like that Sananda, who's that, that Sananda mm-hmm. Edwards that may be in school yeah. right now, where the teacher is trying to pull this stuff out of him or her, and you guys just aren't opening up? I mean, to read this story, yeah. and I'm thinking that this kid had it going on. You were smooth, mm-hmm. brother. You were very popular. Mm-hmm. Women liked you. You, you were very, yeah. great in school. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. everybody loved your smile. Um, yeah. And but then you were dealing with these dealing with mm-hmm. these demons. Yeah, I think um, one one of the big parts, and I have to kind of um, kind of give a lot of credit to my friends. Um, city, the, the thing about city is we had a lot of folks that were coming from across the city. You know, City College is one of those schools that you know it pulls from the best. You know, it's kind of like the best grades, the best young people. So one of those big things was my support system. I had my best friends who were around me who really kind of supported me. Um, but I think just to answer your question. Um, like I said, one of the things that you have to do is, and I think it's such a big deal when you're talking about mental health and young people, noticing the patterns. Um, I know that teachers have, again, as a former teacher, I know and I see um, that there's so much on teachers' plates. Obviously, you have to, you got to have your lesson plan. You got to grade your papers. You got to make sure those tests and quizzes are done. You have a lot on your plates. Teachers are asked to be social workers, psychologists, and, and, action, and just academic teachers. You have to be educators. But you have to try your best to take the time to notice those patterns. When you have that kid that comes in and he's generally bubbly, but something's going on, and you kind of see that that, that kind of that, that, that good-natured humor that they usually extend, you see that shine kind of wear off of that, make sure that you ask the question. And another thing is just making sure that you're aware of the peers who are in their group. Sometimes you can talk directly to that person. Sometimes you might have to talk to their friend, kind of find out, hey, what's going on with Jimmy? Jimmy doesn't seem like he's having too, um, having too good of a day. What's going on with him? So that way, if you can connect with 
their, not just with that individual, but if you can connect also with their peer group, then you're doing a good job. And again, you did a great job of that, Mr. Shields. Like, you were really on point with making sure that we were okay, but you were also good at just making the connections, making the relationships. Relationships are extremely important in any walk of life. doesn't matter what you're doing. If you have a relationship with someone, then that means you can kind of draw some things out. So I would definitely say build that relationship is vitally important, but also kind of recognizing those patterns. When things start going astray, recognizing those patterns and then speaking up and doing something. So like I said, you just, Asking me how things were going made my day 10 times better. And that's a big deal. So why the title, um, The Extraordinary Mr. Nobody? Why that title? Wow, it's, it's just funny. Um, so the, the reason kind of why I came up with that title is because it, it's almost like when you have, when you think about something being extraordinary, you think about something just being amazing, something being brilliant, something being completely awesome. Then you kind of have that, Mr. Nobody part. And that kind of obviously makes you think of nothingness, nobody, darkness. But I also think that when you bring those two together, it kind of, there's kind of like a centering that goes on. You know what I mean? It's almost like life has these amazing, crazy ups and downs. So when things are going extraordinary, that's the kind of going up phase. You know, everything is going up, everything is going great. But then you have the kind of the nobody times when things are going downhill and things aren't going so well. But when you bring those things together, there's almost like a centering that occurs. And really that was one of the biggest goals of my book was to kind of get myself centered, but was to also kind of spread that leveling off and spread that centering to others. Um, again, you're going to be faced with the ups and downs, but we have to find ways to center ourselves. So that's kind of the reason why I came up with that title. So why did you decide to write this book now? Why, why not right after high school or right after directly after college where a lot of this stuff was fresh in your mind? Why, why right now? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, this book, actually, the process of writing this book, it actually happened over about a period. Um, it actually started off as journals, journals, poems, things of that nature. And a lot of people, you know, they do journaling, they do poetry, um, and that was my big thing. I love to write. Um, I got to college and after kind of giving up on some of the craziest majors, like, I, for instance, I was an accounting major for a little while, and it did not work. I hate math, all that wonderful stuff. So um, I had to kind of learn, you know what, find what you're passionate about. Finally ended up being an English major. So in any event, in those classes and, and even in my free time, I was kind of forced to write, you know, kind of write my thoughts down, write all the things that I had going on, doing that journaling, that diary process, writing poems that express my emotion. And I kind of found that it helped me. It was therapeutic. But then after that, I started realizing you know what, there are some folks that are going through the same things, especially kind of going through college. There were folks that were going through the same things that I was kind of going through. So then you take that, and the next step of that is, you know what, I'm not just going to listen to people and hear what they have going on. You know what, I'm going to kind of help some folks, kind of like Mr. Shields helped me. I'm going to go ahead and ask that question. Hey, what's going on? Is everything okay? And I started finding that while we kind of, where some people kind of shared different stories, maybe not exactly the same, but I could empathize with those people. And then after that kind of empathy, it allowed me to get to a point where it's like, you know what, I'm going to help them out. And the funny thing about it is so many people were okay with sharing things with me because I decided to not be judgmental. I try to do two very big things, not be judgmental and be a good listener. I don't have to give my advice every single time. I will. I didn't mind giving it. But I made myself, I made sure that I was a good listener and I also made sure that I was non judgmental. And if you do those things, then it helps. So I went ahead and I kind of put everything down, pulled those, um, pulled all those writings together and all that wonderful stuff, put it together, and this book kind of came out. It, it kind of gets you to a point where you're like, it takes a little bit more than just writing about things and listening to people. You know what? How can I help people? I'm going to put it in book form, and then hopefully it can kind of spread around and it can serve as a healing to what as many people as possible. Well, one of the things that you that you touched on in in the book, and of course, you know, I did not know this that there was a struggle between you and your mom, and there's a, the chapter that says why I hated my mother, and for someone who loves their mother a lot, someone who has invested in me quite a bit. As, as soon as I looked at that, I was like, wow, why mm -hmm. I hated my mother? It sort of just sort of pierced my sort of spirit just to think about that. Um, what, why did you, why did you give it that title of that? And what was going on? Let's talk about what was going yeah. on with you during that time in high school, why you would even say that. Absolutely. So, um, my mom 
my mom is one of Jehovah's, one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the, the, pretty much the short answer. Mom is one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now explain, and, explain to people what that okay. means. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> you, know, if you, in the back yeah. you know when these cats start knocking on your door, when you're cleaning up and watching the cartoons, then, yeah, then, yeah. then y'all tried to be slick and send some nice looking girls to, yeah. through like yeah. a and then, it, then it gets you caught up. But expl- for those people that don't know what your witness are, besides Michael Jackson yeah. being one. Right, right, absolutely. Prince Prince, Prince, Prince was one as well, absolutely. So, So, okay, so, okay, so, those witnesses are definitely, it's it's definitely a religion that's a form of Christianity. They are Christians, and a lot of times that's one of the kind of myths that people tend to think. Um, Those witnesses don't believe in God, they don't believe in Jesus, they absolutely are Christians, they believe in Jesus, they believe in God. They believe in knocking on them doors early in the morning. They do. (laughs) Knocking on y'all out myself. (laughs) How about, how about, about Friday, you know I mean? are you ready for Jehovah's return? Yeah, you know, like all of that, and we do. You know, just that's what we do. It's actually called field service, knocking on doors, going out, evangelizing, knocking on doors, and trying to bring people what Jehovah's Witnesses called the truth. We're going to bring you the truth about the Bible. Everything that Jehovah's Witnesses give you is going to be Bible based, but it's a religion, and it's actually crazy. Like Jehovah's Witnesses are actually one of the like. 20 top religions, possibly 10 by now. I mean, you're talking about like over 8 million people are Jehovah's Witnesses in the world. So it's not like a crazy cult. It's, it's a lot of people that believe in the religion. But, hey, hey, if again. Michael Jackson and Prince are down, come on, you know I'm down. Come on, exactly. Just a little bit. Down with it. <laughs> it's got to be a little bit. But yeah, it's definitely a form of Christianity. Um, and they believe in going to meetings, like, you know, Bible study. They have Sunday. The only thing that they don't have, they don't have like a preacher. They have elders in the congregation, kind of like church does. But, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a religion that's, I mean, it's pretty strict. Um, they're not really allowed to have friends outside of the organization. They don't want you to um, socialize with many people. But one of the biggest things that makes it different from probably many of the religions that I've, you know, kind of looked at or heard about is that they believe in what's called disfellowshipping. Now, with disfellowshipping, what that means is if you are baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you break one of their rules or principles, you can be disfellowshipped. That means you will be kind of cast out of the religion. So you can come to the meetings, but you have to kind of sit in the back. Man, you can no longer. I need to do that in my family. Man. <laughs> Sometimes you got to. Some folks I need to cast out of my family, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, look, 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 I would say do it, but look, do it for maybe like 30 minutes an hour and then go back and give them a hug and get, get it back together, bro. But yeah, you know, they kind of cast you out. And what, what ends up also ends up happening is you can't associate with your friends, but you also can't associate with your family if your family is not in your house. Like if you have an uncle or aunt or anything like that, you can't associate with them. So all that kind of being said, um, my mom brought me up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was rough when you're in high school and you're trying to develop relationships and you're trying to be as social as possible. Um, you know, you, you like to kind of hang out with folks, you like to have a good time, but it was completely against my religion so that was one of the biggest things that my that one of the biggest hurdles that my mom and i had to had to, to, to kind of cross but another big thing was also you can't play sports again you can't associate with people who are considered part of the world so you know you want to go out for the baseball team can't go out for the baseball team you want to go out for the basketball team you can't go out for the well, basketball I think team that's good for you because i don't really i don't really see i never saw any athletic right. ability in you brother so but, maybe this was the perfect but, religion for you <laughs> but let me tell you something, man. My skills, my skills were impeccable. My skills were impeccable, man. Yeah. <laughs> if I just had the chance, if I just had the chance, you know what would be happening? I would be asking you to come be my Hall of Fame speech, man. I was that good. At least, look, at least, at least we'll be outside or out, out back in the field somewhere. I was the man. You know, so this, I was the man. This, oh, was, the, this yeah. was the divide between you because you are yeah. a very popular kid who a lot of people like. So this was the divide between you and your mother. Now, has there been any reconciliation since then, since you've gotten much older, uh, about about where you are with your mother? And, and, if, and if there is so, what was that process like? That's actually a great question. So uh, my mom and I actually, um, a, maybe about six, six or seven years ago, um, my mom had a stroke. And when she had that stroke, that was actually kind of like the catalyst for um, us kind of rebuilding our relationship. I got scared, you know, wait a minute, what's going on with my mom? So I was kind of that primary person that was taking care of her. And during that time, our relationship really, really grew. Um, We were talking about things. Didn't really talk about the past a whole lot, especially with regard to our relationship. Just a little bit. Um, 
but we were talking about things that we never talked about before. We were just sharing time and space with one another. And it was a really, really good thing. So I would definitely say that that's probably really, really big. Um, some conversations are really difficult to have. So as long as you're sharing space with that person and, you know, you're trying to be um, just, just, just making sure that you have a good time when you're around that person. Kind of talk about some things because some things take a long time to heal. So you definitely have to be patient about it, um, but you have to kind of go into it with that spirit of we want to definitely make the best of this. Um, but to be perfectly honest, after the book came out, um, she read the title of that chapter. And right now, um, we're, in a, we're in an awkward place. We're in an awkward place um, because, you know, there's some healing that kind of has to go on from there. But um, I visited her a couple of times, and we're going to actually set up some time, hopefully within the next week, to sit down and talk about things. Because, again, just like you kind of said, that's kind of piercing. I'm sure I did the same thing to her. And, yes, I told her about the book previously, um, but I think seeing it in black and white was difficult. So I'm definitely going to, you know, we're definitely going to sit down and really try to focus on all the kind of strides that we've made, the positive strides that we've made to make that thing happen. Well, well this, book yeah. is a, this book is a healing piece for you. And yeah. you know, I was going to ask you how does she respond, but let's, let's mm-hmm. talk about your friends. Um, yeah. how, how did your friends and your peers and family members mm-hmm. respond to you being this transparent? Because, again, if you, you're hanging out. I'm, I'm your teacher in school. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking everything is okay. I'm your boy, Brandon yeah. Wiley. Yeah, we yeah. yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm thinking everything is okay. And all of a yes, sudden, this, this book comes out. What was their right. response to you about about the book? What so was, again, what I has been their yeah. response. Okay, yeah. So, um, great question. Um, the great thing about um, Brandon Wiley, um, Michael Miller, James Crowder, these guys have been my best friends since high school, and you knew that. You know, like these these guys were my aces, um, and they were my absolute biggest support system these guys knew a lot of the stuff that was going on um with whether it was with regard to my relationship with my mom um some of the dark thoughts i had um they and they were there to be supportive now the reality is some of them like they didn't they didn't know that i kind of dealt with anxiety a little bit because i masked that very well um even though it was super duper draining i was able to mask that but for the most part my friends were always, like, super supportive, and they were kind of like, hey, you know, it's time for your story to come out, man. Let's go save lives. That's what we're about. Um, But they were a big part. Another great thing that they did for me was they shared their families with me. So, you know, I have, you know, another, another, you know, three or four moms and three or four dads. Like, that's how it goes. Um, But they were so super supportive of of my process, of putting the book out, and they're just kind of like, look, man, we're here every step of the way. Not only are we going to support you, but we're going to make sure we're there to help you kind of push this word out and make sure that it reaches as many people as possible. Well, what has been your process to sort of shed that mask, as you said? What does that process look like for someone who's reading the book or someone who's listening? So can you walk through what that looks like? Absolutely. It's interesting. Um, The first thing I'm going to say is it's not... It's not easy. It's not simple. It's not like a one-step type of thing. You can't think that, you know, one day um, everything is going to kind of look like it's in shambles, and then the next day you think everything is just A-OK. You know, you're walking on cloud line, cloud nine. It is absolutely a process. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of put activities in the book, like every chapter except the last one, has some activities that you can do that kind of help you through the process. Um, but the but the primary kind of thread in that process is making sure that you're kind of in tune with yourself more than anyone else. Um, I'll say this, and, and it's, it's probably more true than anything else that's going on. We can blame everyone else for whatever we have going on. And it's true that some people can kind of have a part to play in it. But the primary goal, the primary thing that you have to really, really understand is you have to be able to take care of you. You have to be able to do whatever you can to make sure that you are working through your own processes because the reality is, and I talked to my, I was a fourth, being a fourth grade teacher, I would say this all the time, but it's kind of apropos for anybody, you know, regardless of your age. Who is it that you can control? The only person you can control is you. So because of that, you have to make sure that you kind of gird yourself up. You strengthen yourself. You get as strong as you can. Um, and that means emotionally. Um, that means physically. You know what I mean? Like you have to do the things that will keep you healthy. But the process is really, really, really coming into t- in tune with who you are, being confident in those things. Because I didn't go from dark place to happy place. It was kind of back and forth, back and forth. But when you have certain things in place, when you have a great support system, great friends, 
Um, you make sure that you're in contact with great mentors, people that can kind of mentor you emotionally, spiritually, and even professionally. When you have those things in place, then it makes things a little bit easier. But the biggest thing is staying in tune with who you are. When you feel yourself slipping, I say I call it getting in contact with your nouns, you know, people, places, things. But part of it is knowing what those things are. Like, what are some of those things that help you out? Is it yoga? Is it meditation? Um, is it going to a movie? Is it reading a book? What is it that helps you kind of get, what, what people help you to get to a better place? So when you're able to do that and you can kind of um, solidify those things, write those things down, know what those things are, you can get in touch with those things. And really realize that, again, it's a process. It's not overnight. But if you work at it and you put the right people in your support system and in your place, you'll be, you'll be uh, more successful. What was the most difficult part of writing this book? Was there a particular chapter? Was it just uh, just getting started? What was the most difficult part? Um, honestly, the most difficult part was probably chapter five. Uh, chapter five is about my son, Kai. And um, the chapter really, it was, it was extremely emotional. It was an extremely, extremely emotional chapter. And um, the title of it is The Day My Son Died. Um, and this one you got we, with Johns Hopkins, right? That's when we read Johns Hopkins, absolutely. Um, my son went in, he had like a kind of um, sickness on the left side of his tongue. And the doctors weren't super concerned about it, but they wanted to just kind of make sure that he was okay. So what they suggested was um, that he would have to get an MRI. So we're looking like, you know, you have to get an MRI, you really have to get like an x-ray of his brain to find out what's going on. So we're kind of thinking... How can you get an x-ray of an eight-month-old? How does that work? Um, generally, you have to tell people, if they get an MRI, you got to be still. you got to be still. you got to be still. So how do you get an eight-month-old to be still? So they said they had to sedate him. All right? They had to kind of put him under so that he could be still so they can get the MRI. Um, long story short, he, they put him under, they sedated him. Um, he kept moving, so they sedated him again. And when they did that, he coded. So, again, code is kind of hospital talk for he died, he flatlined. Um, by the grace of God, um, he was revived. The code team came in, they revived him. Um, so he is <laughs> alive and well, uh, praise be to God now. But that was probably the most difficult chapter. And uh, the reason for that is when my son's mom and I, Kim Green, uh, when, when she was pregnant with Kai, to be perfectly honest, I, I wasn't happy about it. Um, it was something I kind of looked at it like, okay, I'm about, I'm about 30 years old. I'm about to have a child. I mean, I'm, I'm working. Thank, you know, money's pretty good. I'm a teacher. I'm loving what, what I'm doing. I'm working with young people every day. This is amazing. But you know what? Having this child is going to cramp my life. I have books I have to write. I have programs I need to get together. I have workshops I need to plan. And having this child, everything that I have is going to be poured into this young man. And I was angry about it. And it was kind of crazy because being a teacher, she I'm telling you, man, I studied you, brother. Um, the kids love me. Oh, man, I'm, the kids love me. The parents love me. You know how that is. Kids love me. Parents love me. The funny teacher. Um, they said, man, you remind me of Chris Rock and this person and that person. They'll be having a good time and they're learning. Um, but having my own was going to be different. It was going to dash my dreams. But that time in the hospital kind of showed me, um, it was almost like I heard a voice. And that voice was kind of like, look, you, are you sure you don't want him? Because he can be gone. He can be taken. Um, so it really just changed my life. Um, it was like, you know what, I'm going to pour everything I can into him. And now, today, again, Kai is seven years old. He's amazing, has all the energy in the world. His uh, big brother, Dalen, oh my goodness, they're all over the place. And I love my kids to death. And it's more like one of those things where it's like you got to make sure that you're, you're, you're focused on your children. you got to pour into them as much as you can. Even if it's just time, give them hugs, give them love, give them love. Because the thing is, children don't take away from your life. They don't. You know what I mean? They are a blessing, and they have to be seen as that blessing so that you can help them through the process and kind of help them, guide them to help you change the world. No question about it. Well, Brother Sananda, well, thank you for writing this great book, The Extraordinary Mr. The Extraordinary Mr. Nobody. Uh, yes, thank you for the memories. I remember you and my girl Ashanti Edwards. You used to call y'all the brother and the sister. You see, you you that. She, too had, yeah. she too was a ball yeah. of energy. And uh, just thank you for the great memories uh, of being a student. And now 
now sort of being a colleague of, of, of sharing sort of the same space of education. Any final thoughts about um, about anything and then let the folks know how they can get in contact with you as well as to get a copy of the book. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, I, I mean, the main thing is that um, I think that one of the biggest things that I want to do is um, I, I am a mental health advocate. So I think the biggest thing that I want to do is I want people, I want to kind of break down that stigma of mental health. That's a big, big deal for me. Um, as someone who not only is a sufferer of mental health, my dad also, um, again, uh, bipolar disorder, manic depression, um, and committed suicide. So when you have that kind of history, um, you want to make sure that you're careful with that when it's in your family. So all that being said, I definitely want to kind of serve as one of those faces of mental health, making sure we're breaking the stigma, not just for children and everyone, but honestly for black men especially, because a lot of times we're asked to be so resilient and we're asked to bounce back all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have to build up. You have to gird yourself up and build up resilience. But you also have to, also have to be honest when you're dealing with some demons and do what you can to fight that. Um, but yeah, um, everyone can definitely check me out at sanandacares.com. That's T S A N O N D A C A R E S dot com. Sanandacares.com. If you want a copy of the book, you can definitely order it um, online at Amazon. Just search Sananda, T S A N O N D A. Um, I'm on Facebook. If you look up Sananda, I'm trust me. Sananda is a pretty unique name. So if you look up Sananda, you will, you will find me. Just please make sure you add the T on the front. It is silent. Sananda, um, look me up. But um, Charles, man, I'm just glad to have been a part of this. I appreciate you, and I really, really appreciate the support you gave me. I told you before, man, unknowingly, man, you helped save my life. And I mean that in the literal sense of the term. I appreciate you for that. And you are one of the guys I use, the thermometers I use to make sure that I'm treating not just myself right, but my family, the community, and this world. I appreciate you for that, brother. No question. Well, I appreciate you, brother Sananda. And I want to thank you again. If you've been listening to, you've been listening to sound bombing, you have my former student. Now he's a warrior on the field with me. Sananda Edwards, the author of the extraordinary Mr. Nobody. I would like to thank my producer, Darius Wilmore and Supreme for the theme music. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen and that some people miss the message because they are too busy looking for the mistake. Thanks for tuning in and do something for someone else today. This is your man, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields. You've been listening to Sound Bombing. 